Hey, you guys. I hope your week is going well. It's been a very difficult week here. I have a lot of physical complications going on and uh, hope you will keep me in your prayers because I've got a lot of a lot of severe symptoms lately that I've been dealing with and um, I have a small break in them at the moment. <laughs> so I'm going to try to make a video today uh, I've been putting this one off for a very long time, um, months. <laughs> Every time I try to make this video, I just can't. But I do want to tell the story of how my husband died and maybe I will be able to get through it today. So we're going to try. I just really want to share the story because I'm always interested in other people's stories of how their spouse died. And sometimes it's helpful to know if maybe you can help someone prevent, you know, a death in the future. Maybe they can get treatment if they notice the same symptoms or, you know, something like that. So maybe it will help someone. Uh, if nothing else, I just want to share in our grief as always. And so it's a complicated, long story, but I'll try to keep it as short as I can, just giving you the gist of it. But yeah, my husband was 53 years old. He was young. He was very fit. He was athletic. He was the picture of health for the longest time. And um, his death was very sudden and unexpected. It was one of those things where it all happens so fast that it's like you don't even know what's going on. You know, it's it wasn't like a car accident where it happens in a split second but it was still extremely fast because you don't expect a super young healthy person to die in a month you just don't and so it all happened very fast within two weeks mostly and so Basically, here is the story. Um, my husband was the healthiest person that I knew, or so I thought. And I really think he was very healthy until he got COVID. I will always believe that he died from COVID complications even though it led to cancer, he was never the same after COVID. He got COVID in 2020 and he was never the same after that. You know, he went from this really lively, full of energy. He was never tired. He never had a headache. He he wasn't sick that often unless it was like a cold or flu and he was just the picture of health you know he was one of those people that could sleep for three hours a night and then work all day long and he still wasn't tired he was still just super hyper and like raring to go <laughs> type of person you know and he was just like that most of his life and so all of that changed when he got COVID and he was, he never had the energy that he had before. He still had a lot of energy, but it was just never as much as he had before. And, you know, he would get tired sooner. He would kind of struggle to get going in the mornings, which 
for a lot of people, that's normal, but for him, it was not. He was, he was never tired, like I said. So, that was one little thing that changed after he got, he had a really, really hard time with COVID. I mean, I was scared that he would die, actually, because it, it, nothing had ever hit him so hard like that before. But he recovered. And even though he was tired on and off, mostly we thought he was okay. And so then he got COVID again in January of last year, which was 2022. And it was hard for him the second time. And he started developing difficulty breathing. Like, I won't go into all of the details. It would take too long. But, you know, he just started having things that he'd never had before after that. Like, it would be hard to breathe sometimes. And his he said it felt like someone was, like, gripping his throat the way his throat felt. Like, it was just hard to get air. This is when he had COVID the second time. And so he had the typical symptoms when he went through that, you know, terrible body pain, exhaustion, weakness, fever, nausea, sore throat, shortness of breath, all that stuff. But again, he recovered for the most part, or so we thought. And he was pretty much back to normal uh, after Valentine's Day. But he had symptoms of like long COVID, which he had really bad headaches at least once a day. And that went on a whole year almost. But other than that, you know, he seemed to recover and be okay. Um, he was still tired more so than before and he had the headaches every day but other than that he seemed to recover. So life was basically back to normal. Then out of the blue on July 8th of last year, that's when everything started to happen in a blur, basically. So he got what he thought was an ant bite on his arm. He got this little bump, blister type bump. And that day, he thought he had been bitten by an ant, but then it turned into like three or four bumps. So he thought he had poison ivy because he worked in heating and air and the heating unit he had worked around that day had poison ivy in it that they had to pull out and he was wearing gloves, but he didn't know what else it could be. He's got these itchy bumps on his arm now and so, <laughs> oh, my sweet baby. He had autism, so his mind, if something was wrong, he would drive himself nuts trying to figure it out. And so, you know, he was just, oh, something's wrong with me because I have these bumps on my arm. What is it? And he was going a million miles an hour trying to figure it out. So he finally decided it was poison ivy since he'd worked around it that day. So, he got calamine lotion, put it on his arm, uh, where the bumps were, and then that night, he lost his voice. <laughs> that was random. He just, he went hoarse. Suddenly, and for no reason. Well, we didn't know the reason then. 
So now he can barely talk and he was very confused. Uh, so the next day was July the 9th. He's asking me all these questions because he doesn't know what's going on and he has bumps in his mouth now. And so he was like, can poison ivy get in your mouth? And I didn't really think that was a very common thing. We were like, how did you get poison ivy in your mouth? Like, but you know, he didn't know what was going on. So we were all scrambling, <laughs> trying to figure out what was going on. So, <sighs> I'm trying to remember that time period was such a blur. So he has no voice now. He's like talking at a whisper, like you do when you have a cold or the flu or something, you know, bronchitis, whatever. So he thought, am I sick? Because I don't feel sick, <laughs> but I can't talk. So he figured the poison ivy must have gotten into his mouth, infected his throat, because now his throat was burning. He said he felt like his throat was on fire. And so at that point, I was kind of like, maybe you should go to prompt care and just see what they think because that's, you know, you can have a bad allergic reaction to something that we didn't know what was going on. But you know, my husband was the type of person that did not want to go to the doctor unless uh, it, it has to be dire. <laughs> he was just that way, like, nope. <laughs> I am not going to the doctor unless I absolutely have to. So, we went around and around with that. He didn't want to go. He's like, oh, it's just poison ivy. I'll be okay in a few days, kind of thing, you know. So, he was feeling bad, though. Um, he just felt sluggish, he said, and run down and weird, to put it in his words. He said he just felt weird, like, like he knew something was wrong, but he just didn't know what it was. So the bumps start spreading, and it seemed like the throat thing was scary because you know, I didn't want him to go into anaphylaxis or something if he had an allergic reaction to the poison ivy. So, he took a COVID test to make sure he didn't have COVID. Rule that out. And, um, you know, that day he seemed mostly fine. We were watching TV. We were, you know, he was eating his normal dinner. We were just hanging out, doing our typical thing. And the next day, he felt even worse. And um, it took another day of convincing him, but by the next day, July 11th, he was feeling really bad. So I finally got him to go to prompt care. And they didn't know what was going on either. They just figured it was the flu or something like that. So they tested him for COVID, they tested him for the flu. Um, finally, you know, they took three x-rays um, that looked fine. He did have a fever though. It was 101.9. So they thought he just had like the flu virus, but that came back negative. So nobody really knew at this point what is going on. So they just figured that it was, uh, the poison ivy had gotten into his bloodstream and 
they gave him like steroid shot so he could breathe better and uh, antibiotics and they sent him home. So he started taking the medications and then he got even worse the next day. So, you know, this is, he, and at this point he's still working full time hard and not thinking anything of it. And so things got really bad on July 18th. That's pretty much when everything changed for the much, much worse. Uh, that night, well, the night before, he uh, had a really, really rough night. Just shortness of breath couldn't breathe, chest pain, really bad chest pain, severe, severe headaches, in his words. Um, I think he had diarrhea, he had cold chills on and off, um, just feeling really bad. And I guess the chest pain and the headaches were the worst and the trying to catch his breath all night long. And so the next day on the 18th of July, that's when he went to the emergency room. My dad took him and because I was very sick at the time too, and he was scared to death. He had something contagious and he, he didn't want to be around me because he didn't want to get me sick. So my dad took him to the emergency room that was a rough day because they didn't know what was going on and my poor baby had to suffer because they didn't find out what was wrong until the next day when he had to go back because they sent him home uh, thinking it was monkey pox because he had the bumps all over his arms and it was moving up to his neck and in his mouth and on his face. So monkeypox was uh, going around in our state and some other states. So they called in the CDC. He was quarantined for that. They were running tests on that, which took like a day or two <laughs> to even get the test back. <sighs> you can probably feel my frustration if you've been through something like this. So they didn't know what was going on. They thought, oh, he's got monkeypox probably, so we'll just send him back home. Terrible, terrible mistake. I knew that was a mistake, but they didn't test for much anything else. Just, I don't really know why, but. So they sent him back home and he got even worse that night with like massive chest pain and I wasn't there because he didn't want me in the same place with him because if it was monkeypox his biggest fear was making me worse since I'm already chronically ill so he stayed in the RV and he's the kind of person that he won't tell me if he's suffering because he just doesn't want to go to the doctor. He doesn't want to be a burden. And I told him that was never a burden, but you know, if you're familiar with autism, you know that sometimes it's hard for them to really understand things. And he just, <sighs> my poor precious baby, he just wouldn't tell me how bad he was hurting because he didn't want to bother me. And I told him over and over, please bother me because I need to know. So he didn't, he pretty much just thought he would, I guess, sweat it out. And he didn't really tell anybody how bad he was suffering that night until the next day. 
and he had extreme shortness of breath. Um, his body was like, he couldn't really sit up or move. It was almost like paralysis type thing, you know, where you can't get out of the bed. <sighs> and he just had really bad chest pain. His headaches were worse. Everything was worse. And so when I checked on him the next day, he, I knew it was bad because this is not the kind of person that would ever ask <laughs> to go to a doctor. And he, he told me that he might need an ambulance. So <laughs> I knew at that point it was bad because he didn't even want to go to a doctor. So for him to ask for an ambulance, I knew it was not good. The only reason he wanted an ambulance is because he was afraid that, that he was going to give me or my family something terrible. But my dad took him back anyway, and... Um, this time they ran more tests and they finally figured out what was wrong. And it had nothing to do with poison ivy. He probably never even had poison ivy at all. And it wasn't monkeypox, that was a negative. But they finally figured out that he had something called AML, which is a blood cancer, acute myeloid leukemia, and it's a very aggressive blood bone marrow type of cancer. But they thought, they still thought he was going to be fine because the doctor said. Oh, it's easy, easy to treat. You just have to treat it promptly. You know, she gave us hope. She said, if you catch it in time, he'll be fine. He'll be in like a new man. <laughs> well, so none of us were really, I mean, we were devastated, of course, but we were hopeful we didn't have any doubt that he would pull through that he would go through the treatment and he would be okay you know um we all thought he was going to be fine he was a fighter he's the toughest person i know so <sighs> most of it after that is just a jumble of not being able to even think, but he had to wait another 24 hours to actually get to the cancer center, which I was not happy about how long they took to get him there. They told us it had to be treated ASAP, and then they waited around another whole day and by the time he got there, <laughs> sorry, by the time he got there, he went into respiratory distress. He had a mild heart attack and he just could not breathe or keep his oxygen up. So, He ended up in the ICU on a ventilator. And they would try to get him off of the ventilator. And I think they did for like a day. And then he had to go right back on it because he just couldn't breathe. You know, they started out with the normal oxygen tube and high flow oxygen I think it's called and then they bumped that up to something stronger and it just it wasn't working so 
He ended up on the ventilator and they didn't know if he should be treated for the cancer or not while he was on the ventilator. ventilator. Uh. So uh, they finally did decide to go ahead and do the chemo because, you know, he was, he was going to die without it. And they didn't know if it would work, but they were hopeful that it would work. And I thought it would work too. But it, it didn't. I'm sure there's lots of details that I can't even remember right now. But basically, he had to be sedated just because he kept coughing and struggling to breathe. And so once he was on the ventilator, which, which he went on on his 53rd birthday, July 22nd. And I never got to talk to him again after that. It was as if he died on his birthday. Because the day before was the last day I ever got to talk to him. And he fought so hard. I mean, he, he hung in there. He wanted to live. He fought hard. I mean, he hung on from July 22nd to August the 10th. And the nurse said that as much as he had going on, nobody else had ever made it that long. <laughs> and I knew he wanted to live. And I knew he was fighting for me. <sighs> During those days, everything just escalated. He had the chemo treatment, but his platelets never came up. They gave him so many bags of platelets. It just wouldn't come up. He had infections that they didn't know what they were, but the cultures would come back positive. And he developed something called ARDS, Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome. He got all of these blood clots in his lungs. <sighs> and they did several procedures to try to get the blood clots out of his lungs, but it just ended up hemorrhaging because he didn't have the platelets to clot. And his kidneys were shutting down pretty much completely. He was on dialysis 24-7 by the time. By the time he died. And watching all of that and having to make that decision that you never want to make. But the doctors are saying they won't get better. They're just going to get worse. And pretty much the machine was the only thing keeping him alive. And you don't even feel like you're in your body. <laughs> you feel like it's some out-of-body experience. Watching that. And, uh, that was, that was pretty much it. When they took him off the life support, he, he died. 
in just a matter of minutes. And that's how fast it can happen, you guys. I mean, all of that was pretty much within a month. One day you're supposedly fine. And a month later, or a day later, weeks later, you're gone. And my heart really hurts for anyone that's ever had to go through this. I don't, I don't think there's anything worse. <sighs> I'll talk more about things later. Um, but this video is long enough, so I just basically wanted to share that story of how he died. I think this is one of the last presents that he ever gave me. It was the Easter Bunny for last year. And I have a picture of him holding it. So this is a special little guy for me. My last little bunny. I guess it'll take me a while to, to go recover now. <laughs> uh, you guys know how it is. You think about that day or that moment or that however long it was for you. <laughs> you can just be a crying mess all over again. It's hard to relive those days, isn't it? Well, I will talk to you guys later. Big bunny hugs until next time, okay? <laughs> We're gonna get through this one way or another. <laughs> Take care.